Good morning, church. I hope you're well. We're going to have a good time of worship this morning. Um, wherever you are, whatever situation, um, I just encourage you to, to either just to listen and sit back and listen or to uh, stand up um, and sing out loud because it's only going to be the neighbours that are going to hear you. We're going to sing a, a couple of songs first about uh, welcoming God into our situation wherever we are. The first one says, uh, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, and the second song, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. So let's sing together.
Psalm 46 um, explains a little bit of the taste of this, uh, this next song, Goodness of God. Psalm 46 says, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fail me. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear that the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Verse 8 says, Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This is goodness of God.
times that are testing for us, we just thank you that you go before us.
Well, it's a virtual good morning, church, from me and Gary behind the camera. Welcome to Cornerstone City Church. We're virtual, but we're real at the same time. I've been looking forward to seeing you guys, and I'm sorry that it's this way, but this is the way that it is. We're going to have, uh, I hope, a reasonably good time now, and shortly uh, after we've had, we've finished this part of the service, Thanks so much for the worship. It was really challenging and really awesome, Nick. Thanks so much for that. So we've had our worship. We're going to have our word now, and then we're going to go into a Zoom meeting where we're going to have communion afterwards. So I'm looking forward to sharing the Lord's Supper with you there. So let's get right into it. I don't know if you saw it the other day, but I posted a pretty cool video. It was of a little girl. If you want to look it up on my posts on Facebook, you'll find it. And she was a little cutie, but her mum was informing her, her that because of the lockdown and all the things that are going on, she wouldn't be able to have any more food from a takeaway place. And she was blowing up deluxe. Ah, no more KFC. Ah, no more McDonald's. Ah. She even said, could we have Chinese? And mum said, no. Ah, this massive big lower lip came out. She was sobbing. She said, can we have deliver we? Deliver we? No, no deliveries. <laughs> oh, the drama. Oh, my goodness gracious me. She said, you're going to have to just have mummy's cooking now. <laughs> it was a tragedy. The poor thing was overwhelmed. Now, I recommend it to you. Look it up. It's a really good laugh. It, it's kind of good, isn't it, every now and again when our whole world is full of bad news at the moment. Just have a little break. But when I looked at that clip, I was thinking, I wonder if sometimes, not just at this time, but other times, the angels in heaven look at Christians and they think they're a, maybe just a little bit like that girl. In that her whole deal was she was totally focused on what she was losing. She can't have this and she can't have that. But really, as Christians, no matter what anybody tries to take from us, they're things they can never take away. And I've noticed that people who get through difficult times, they don't focus on what they've, they've lost. They focus on what they've got left and what can never be taken from them. So as Christians, as children of God, I think we can have hope in difficult times. And this is a difficult time. I don't want to take away from that. This is a serious time. It's an important time. It's a world-shaking time. Some things will never be the same. Some economies will take years to recover. Some of our own people are working in the, in the NHS. So we know we're touched by the difficulty they're going through. And of course, we're all stuck at home now for most of the time. And so this is real. I don't want to make light of it. But here's my message in the middle of it. God is good, God is unchanging, and we can have hope. Can we just pray now with me, if you would? Heavenly Father, it feels somehow that um, we're stuck in this dystopian movie that somebody's cast us in bit part roles, and it's so surreal. And we look out our windows and nobody's going by. It's all gone quiet. Uh, there are strange things happening. We're concerned. We're concerned about jobs and economies and people's lives. But we just want to say in the middle of it that we hope in you. And we know that no matter what somebody takes away from us, you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. And so we want to begin looking at your word and, and reflecting on it from this position of being believers. We believe in you. So come today and speak to us as we go through this time, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've got a little scripture for you. It's in Acts. You'll probably just have enough time as I talk about it and, and, and fudge a little bit so you can find your Bible or, or look it up. And it's in Acts, Acts 16. And it's a little section, I think, that's like a, almost a picture of what's happening to the church. You could use it that way at the moment. And it's when Paul was locked down, just like us, only worse. Let me read you from chapter 16 and uh, verse about 24. Uh, when he'd been severely flogged and cast into prison, the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully because Paul was with his friend Silas. Upon receiving the orders, he was put in the inner cell and fastened 
uh, with their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake, the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household, and you will be saved. And they spoke the word of God, the Lord, to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his family were baptised, and the whole house were filled with joy. Something that you might have noticed from that reading is that the jailer had to come and bring candles and torches for light. So Paul and Silas were chained, locked down completely, if you like, to guards in pitch black. It was midnight. There was no light. It would have been cold and dank and the chains would have been heavy. This is a pretty, pretty nasty experience to be in. And yet inside all of that, in his heart, he and Silas were free. No matter what they took from him, even if they took his liberty, they couldn't take his freedom inside. And in these days we're in, lots of things are going to be taken from us. I just want to remind you that we live out of the things that can never be taken from us. We live out of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So uh, we're not shaken by these times. Our world is shaken, but on our insides, there's something unshakable. The rhythms of our lives won't change internally. We still fast, we still pray, we still study the word, we still meet with each other, even if it's over the internet now. And our preaching isn't changing. At the moment, we're going through the season of Lent. Easter's coming up pretty soon. And we're looking at freedom today, the freedom that Jesus brought us on this cross. Make no mistake, even though it was 2,000 years ago, that experience of Jesus on the cross is the source of all we have as Christians today. It was our defining moment, the source of our freedom, the source of our identity as Christians. And there was a catalyst for hope and faith and love that have shaped civilizations, societies, nations, and individuals. The resurrection proved Jesus was who he, who he said he was. It proved his words were true when he came back to life and met the disciples and met with them and ate, them and touched, ate with them and touched them. They knew that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And that gave birth to hope, living hope that still trans transforms lives in every situation. The freedom bought on the cross includes freedom from fear. Ancient people people of biblical times, they were afraid all the time. They were literally afraid of the dark because in their world, the darkness was filled with demons and robbers and, and all sorts of evil goings on. They were afraid of crop failure. They were afraid of the local kings. They were afraid of the local rulers. They were afraid of the gods they fashioned and put uh, themselves on little poles at the end of their row of corn and bowed down to them, so afraid of them that if they felt the God called them to sacrifice their own children on an altar, they would. But in the Bible, God says, and I'm going to give you smarty pants as times to look good in front of your family. How many times in the Bible does it say either fear not or don't be afraid? I'm going to give you, a, let's say, three seconds. One, two, three. Who's the smartest guy in the room, smartest gal in the room? 365 times it says don't be afraid in the Bible. One for every day. So every day there's another biblical reason not to be afraid. Why are we not afraid? Because when we look at the cross, we know that the God who made the, the whole universe and sent his only son, that whoever will believe in him would not die but have eternal life, that's a loving God right there. That's why we're not afraid. We're not afraid because our God is a universe-making God who has our back. As a matter of fact, he's got your front, your sides, the soles of your feet, the tops of your head. He's got your finances. He's got your health. He's got your future. He's got your destiny. God's got you. 
So don't be afraid. He's got a storehouse from which he can bless you every day for the rest of your life. Now in the West, I think we're used to the last few decades at least, to being relatively confident about the future. We've got enough food on our plates. Uh, we, if we lose our jobs, we can get some government assistance. We're used to being pretty sure that life will probably get better if we work a bit harder and, and things are going to be, work out okay. But now the West is being shaken. The whole world is being shaken. But amongst it all, because we've got our feet on the rock, we are not shaken inside. Do not be afraid. God is for you. Fear is a natural reaction to all sorts of threats and shocks, and we're all susceptible to it and to its children, anxiety and worry. But I want to encourage you to hand the cares over to Christ. Cast your cares on him, the Bible says, because Jesus cares for you. There have been some great stories already on our Facebook page of how God has been working in the hearts of our people to share and bring love and comfort and support there was a, I really like the little one of, I think it was Naomi ran out of nappies and they, she just got a little baby, one month old, I think yesterday, and uh, ran out of mini nappies and prayed about it and somebody bought some. I've been really impressed by stories of people going door to door uh, and, and knocking on neighbours doors, standing back, of course, keeping the distance and seeing if there's anything we could do to help. I've been really encouraged to see on Facebook stories of our people ministering to each other in a difficult time. In the next few weeks, stories are going to fill the papers with numbers of people becoming ill and worse. The sense of awfulness of it all will tend to fill us up. But I want to encourage you not to be afraid and to turn your cares into prayers. Be confident that Jesus reigns in this and over this, and we're going to get through this. We have freedom in Christ to continue on the inside just as we were and even to grow and to flourish. God has not abandoned us. The church is not going out of business. As a matter of fact, we might be a time of great, in a time of great opportunity. God is still at work in all of this. We may look back on this as a church and say that was really the making of us. We went through a breakthrough season when all that was going on. Um, we run a great worship experience as a church, but I think we're going to learn that there's new ways of reaching people beyond inviting them come to our worship service. Uh, I think the whole church in the West is going to learn that lesson if they haven't already. Some of us already know this and it's old news. So for a lot of younger people and people who are isolated for health reasons and what have you, they've been on the net and doing stuff connecting for years and years. But most churches like ours have never really taken it that seriously. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us. Let me read you something a friend of mine sent me uh, not too long ago, a couple of days ago. And his church has just started live streaming like us last week. And they had some interesting findings. And I think we will have them as well. Um, uh, our church, like many other churches across the world, went online for the first time on Sunday. Those watching exceeded our normal attendance, and if you take into account that more than one person was using many of the devices, perhaps more significant than this was the 1,400 hits that took place after the event with a reach of more than 4,000 people. Here's the experience of a church that's been live streaming for years. Some friends of ours go to a church with an average attendance of about 75 people in a community of about 20,000. There are some other churches there, but obviously plenty of people who don't go to church. As soon as they live streamed, they got the same kind of effect our church did. More than a thousand people taking a look. After 18 months, actual attendance in the church physically had increased to 150, so they doubled in 18 months. For, uh, here's what they've learned. There are far more people interested in church in our community than we know about it. The problem is we don't know who they are so we could have a conversation with them. Secondly, there's a considerable fear factor in terms of people actually attending. The live streaming helped lower the barrier of unfamiliarity felt by many. Watching the service remotely helped them create a kind of relationship 
that enable people to actually attend. There's a little bit more, but I, I won't go into that now. So that was a really interesting, interesting um, uh, email. And I thought I have something uh, that we've already experienced in our prayer meetings, that already we're seeing in our prayer meetings, more people are um, attending remotely than could physically, uh, perhaps for reasons of time and distance uh, and what have you. So the church is not ending. This is going to be a new beginning for the church. I'm hoping that uh, we're, this is going to be a breakthrough for us. God is going to reshape how we meet and share the gospel even after this crisis is over so we can reach thousands more people now than we do today, but in different ways. I want to say, though, that it's really, really important that we each overcome our fear of entering into this new thing and this new opportunity God's going to give us. Because it's not just going to be technology that changes our reach with the gospel. One of the things we're learning is people still need people. Remotely, yes, it's helpful. But it's the personal touch of the gospel offered by your hands and my hands as we meet with people and pray with people that I think God is calling out of us at this time. He's calling us out of our doors, which is counterintuitive when we're all being locked down. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Let's look at church history. In Roman times, when plagues hit that city, officials and pagan priests fled to the countryside and scores of people died, but thousands of Christians stayed. They tended the sick and they adopted the orphans of those who died. The witness of the church burned brighter in that city than the bodies of the Christians that the Roman emperor had earlier turned into torches to light the streets. In Martin Luther's time, the bubonic plague accounted for, some people say, up to a third of the population of Europe. But rather than flee, Martin Luther and his family and many other Christian leaders stayed to tend the flock and to tend to those who were sick and dying who didn't go to church. Many Christians, including his own daughter, died of that plague. But the witness that the church left behind in that place burned brightly for years afterwards. People remembered who cared, and God cared through those people. Saturday morning, I read an amazing story of a pastor in Wuhan, whose church somehow quickly grasped when the virus first began there, what was going on and what was going to be needed. And so what the pastor did was to email his friends overseas and send for urgent supplies of face masks and gloves. They went into the streets with masks and gloves and all the sort of hazmat suits, and they gave away little packages with a mask, a set of gloves, and a one-page tract in it about Jesus. They gave away in one hospital 400 high-quality uh, face masks and sets of gloves to doctors and nurses in that hospital before even the government agencies had time to work out what to do. I want to read you uh, something from Heart Cry Mission I just read this morning. And uh, it's a very similar story from Wuhan. A few months ago, a pastor I knew, with, along with his church members, was preaching the gospel on the streets of Wuhan. He kept on preaching even when Christians were not encouraged to share the gospel and told off. But nothing stopped him proclaiming the gospel. Now it's the 10th day since the city has been separated by quarantine. So this is a few weeks old. And protective masks are the most valuable thing in Wuhan. Money is useless because you can't find a store that sells the masks. People are in a desperate situation. In response, our brothers and sisters preach the gospel and give away free masks and a tract. They're sharing the word of hope and comfort of God and they've become more favoured in the city, even in the authorities' eyes. These churches in Wuhan keep themselves away from the rumours and political issues. They just do what a true Christian should do in this situation. They preach the hope of the gospel and they witness the love of God that came in Jesus. A police officer came to one sister, listened to the gospel and left with a tract and a mask happily. After a while, another police officer arrived, heard and left with the tract and the mask also. Shortly, the first one came back saying another officer would like one too. Then four more officers came. They used to, they're the ones who used to be concerned and give a hard time to the people who are preaching in the street. 
but now they came to Christians for help and they bow down to our God. The yellow Christians, who wear yellow suits for protection, so they're practicing safety in the midst of this, they have gained the respect they never had because of their willingness to risk their health to serve. I thank God for the witness and full of joy for our Lord's amazing work. Please put them in your prayers. The yellow Christians. It reminds me of a picture I saw once from some of you will remember years and years ago, there was a terrible, terrible Barney in the Congo, I think it was, between Hoots, where was it? Hoot, Hoot, Hoot. Who remembers what I'm talking about? It can't be Tutus, that was Desmond uh, and from South Africa. It was the Hootsies and some other group, and they were literally killing each other. It was genocide. And there were people with machetes hacking each other to people in the streets. It was a horrible experience. But somebody painted a picture of a preacher in there, and funnily enough, he had a yellow blazer on. He was holding up a Bible and calling people to peace. That picture went sort of global at the time. It would be probably 20 years ago. It was in the genocide in Rwanda, I remember now. And that African man with a yellow jacket, and somebody painted, and the yellowness of the jacket, it stood out amongst all the crowd in the darkness and the gloom and the terrible things that were happening. And in Wuhan, the yellow Christians, they're called, stood out. And I think God's calling us to stand out. He's calling us up and calling us out. Now, some of you be saying, oh, we can't go out. It's not safe. I understand that. But somewhere we've got to say, if we take all the steps and we're very cautious and we wash our hands and we sanitize and we keep social distance. If people are allowed to go to work on a building site, I'm pretty sure it's okay for us to go and knock on somebody's door, put the card in there that says if you have a need and step back six or eight feet and say, hi, my name is, I live down the road. I just want you to know if you need any shopping done or if you're shut in or you've got any needs, just give me a call, the number's on that card and I'll see you if you need me. Some people are gonna remember this forever. Rhonda did this on our street and she met a lady who hadn't, she'd lost a husband two weeks ago. It made such a difference to her know that somebody in the street cared for her. Hopefully this will be over before long and things will go back to normal, but I don't want everything to go back to normal. We'll probably be streaming services for years and years now and getting better and better at it and hopefully increasing our reach. But I think God's calling us in this time to stand up and be the people of God in the midst of whatever plague we're experiencing. And for that, I want to encourage you not to be afraid. Be careful, be wise, obey the government's rules, but don't stop phoning. Start having Zoom calls with people in your street. Knock on the door and step back eight feet or so and say, if there's anything I can do, let me know. I'm praying for you. Because perhaps we, the people of God, are experiencing one of those for such a time as this moment. I want to end with a prayer of blessing and benediction, if it's okay with you, before we go into the Zoom room. It's from Romans chapter 8. You could probably guess it was coming because this, these scriptures will probably be read all around the world uh, uh, at a time like this. And they're the scriptures that remind us that God is still in his heaven and we need not be afraid. Let me read you these words if I can. What shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all, long, all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know that we're going through difficult times, but I just wanted to remind you this morning not to be afraid. God has our back. He's doing works in us and through us that we believe will shape the way that people of this city see the church and see God because of it. 
We're going to do new things with technology. I'm really excited about that. Even though it feels kind of weird, I can tell you right now. But I hope that you hear the call of God to go deeper in freedom. Freedom from fear. Make the call. Knock on the door. Step back six, six feet and be a witness for Christ this week. God bless. Amen.